we're going to uh, use an RNN and we're going to address a different kind of um, sequence um, problem, and this is time series forecasting. So what you see in here is three time series, and these are financial time series, and they cover the period 1960 to 1990. Okay, and these are daily time series. Daily meaning trading days. So it's five days a week, five trading days a week. And in the top plot, you see the log of trading volume. In the middle plot, you see the Dow Jones return. It's an index. And in the lower plot, you see a, a measure of volatility on that day. Okay. And the red line is indicating we're going to use this first part of the data for training a model, and we're going to test it out on the, on, on the slightly grayed out version of the data. Right? So it's a training and test set. And this is important when you deal with time series because, as you'll see, the data are autocorrelated. So you can't just randomly select some training days and, and, and test days. You need to sort of break apart time like that. There's a period. I got it a little bit wrong. There's 6,051 trading days from 1962 to 1986. So the log trading volume is a fraction of all outstanding shares that are traded on that day relative to a 100-day moving average of past turnover on the log scale. So there's a definition, it's a constructed variable. Dow Jones return is just what it is. This is the difference between the log of the Dow Jones Industrial Index on consecutive trading days. That's the, where the word return comes from. The log volatility, this is based on the absolute values of the daily price movements. So the goal here is to predict log trading volume tomorrow, given its observed values up to today, as well as, as observed values of the Dow Jones um, return and the log volatility. And here we give a reference for these data. They were assembled by LeBaron and Weigand in um, 1998. And so you can find that reference. So it's interesting here. We're going to try and predict log trading volume. That's something, turns out, is you can do a reasonable job doing. If you had to try and predict the Dow Jones return or stock prices, that would be a much, much harder problem. I was just going to ask you whether you could help me to <laughs> improve the yield on my portfolio. Are you the right person to ask for this? Rob, I'm the absolute <laughs> worst problem to ask. In fact, if you ask me, what you could do is, is move in the other direction. Okay. Maybe I'll try it. So here's the log trading volume, and what we're showing here is what's known as an autocorrelation function at different lags. So what you, the autocorrelation function does is the following. V is the, index, is the variable we, who, we, that we call in uh, log trading volume, and we've got, we look at pairs Vt and Vt minus L. So that means they're at a lag of L trading days apart, Right? So imagine all the pairs you could get like that in the, in the data set. And we take those pairs and compute the correlation of those pairs of numbers. And that's called the autocorrelation of lag L. And here we show the autocorrelations of lag 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And you can see, so the log trading volume has a correlation of 0.7 between values today and values yesterday. That's lag one. Not much lower between values two days apart. Right? So that, that's, that's what's known as autocorrelation. And when you look at a series, that's kind of what you see in here. You know, it does, it's not chaotic. This looks much more chaotic, the, the Dow Jones return. But the trading volume, it tends to go up for a while, come down for a while. There's a lot of noise. But that, those sort of small trends that you see is a reflection of this autocorrelation, okay? So these sizable correlations give us confidence that past values will be helpful in predicting the future. And this is a, a curious prediction problem because the response is Vt. We want to predict the log trading volume at a particular time t. But it's also going to be part of the features. We're going to use values of that same sequence that lags back to predict the value at Vt. So it's, it's fair game to use values of the series from earlier days to predict into the future. 
So let's see how we set this up for a, a recurrent neural network. We only have one series of data. So how do we set up an RNN? So what we do is we first of all decide on the number, the lag, the number of lags we're going to use, which we call earlier. And in our example, we're going to use a lag of five. Okay. And we're going to make, extract many short mini series of input sequences. And they're going to be of the form x1, x2, up to xl. And remember, it, l is going to be five here. And what is going to be in these elements? Well, here they are. So we're using v, r for the, for the Dow Jones return, and z for the volatility. And so remember, we need a sequence of length five here, or of length l. So they're going to be vt minus l, rt minus l, zt minus l, those three numbers. That's going to be the first element in the sequence. The second is going to be, so that's at lag five if l is five. Then we're going to get those so, same three numbers at lag four back, lag three back up to lag one back. Okay, so that's how we make the sequence. But of course, you get these five, three vectors if you start at time t. If you go to a different time, you get a different set of three vectors. So the number of observations are the number of time points. The features are these lagged versions of the, of the three series. And the response is the log volatility at the particular time. So we have 6,051 trading days. And with LE5 equals 5, we can, turns out we can create 6,046 such XY pairs. And by X here, we mean X is a sequence, right? And a sequence of three vectors. And it's slightly less because obviously right at the beginning, we can't lag back because there's nothing, you know, there's nothing to lag to. So we just truncate. And we use the first 4,281 as training data and the following 1770 as test data. That's the shaded parts in, the, in those um, initial images. And we're going to fit a recurrent neural network with 12 hidden units per lag step, i.e. per AO. So each AO will be a vector of 12 units. This is a picture of the log trading volume for the test period. And the black is the observed, and the orange is the predicted from the RNN. And it looks pretty good to me. Hey, Rob? Yeah. It's, it's a little short. It doesn't get the highest peaks or the lowest dips but it pretty much follows this, the sequence. You can see that. The R squared is 0.42 on the, on the test data. One way of comparing that is an R squared of 0.18 for a straw man. A straw man is, is sort of the na a natural competitor. In this case, that's easy to compute. And the straw man we use is, we're going to use yesterday's value of log trading volume to predict that of today. Right? That should be pretty good, right? Because of that order correlation. So we don't expect the straw man here to be useful, useless, but it gets an R squared of, of 0.18 and we can do considerably better using an RNN. Now, since we've gone into this example, we're going to tell you about um, another way of doing forecasting using a very similar structure, and that's known as autoregression. And this is just using linear models, okay? So, the structure is the same. You, you set up a data set, and we'll first use the, the response itself, which is the log trading volume. And you create a data set where you have a sequence of the responses. It goes up to V capital T and goes all the way down, and we go back to lag L plus 1 because we, we need to create lag variables, and we can't go further back than that. And then we build up a a model matrix. We've got an intercept. We've got the, you know, for, so for each, say, VT, we've got a VT minus 1 is going to be a feature. A VT minus 2 is a feature up to VT minus L. And then if you go to the next time point back, right, you'll get the same things, but one time step back until eventually the response VL plus 1 has features VL, VL minus 1 up to V down to V1. So this is a traditional autoregression setup 
where you just got one sequence and you're using lagged versions of that sequence to predict the response. But of course, we can augment this matrix with lagged versions of the, the log Dowd Jones return and the volatility measure as well. So if you look back, this is a very similar data structure to what was used for the RNN. But now what we do is just a plain linear regression. We do a linear regression of this response set of response numbers using this data matrix to make our predictions. And this is known as an order L autoregression model, or ARL. So yes, we'll have, if we got lags, say five, we're going to have three L plus one columns, because we've got three different variables, and the interhept is, is the additional one. Okay, we'll just tell you some results here. So for the ARL5 model, we get an R squared of 0.41, and it's got 16 parameters, three times five plus one. The RNN that we described earlier as an R squared of 0.42, slightly better, um, with 205 parameters. Many more parameters. This is, this is a, a repeating story with neural networks. You can have lots more parameters and you don't pay much in terms of overfitting It's because of the way they fit in and regularized. You can take this structure for the, the AR model and instead of fitting a linear model, you can just fit it through a feed-forward neural network. Okay, and when we did that, we get the same performance as the RNN. You can add another variable, which turns out to be really informative for log trailing volume, which is the day of the week. Was it a Monday, Tuesday, or Fridays, right? And that turns out that all the models improve, and you can get an R squared of 0.46. Okay, so that's the end of autoregression. Two examples, one using an RNN, one using more standard uh, statistical model. A little bit different in, in structure, performance somewhat similar. So to summarize um, RNNs, so we've presented the simplest of RNNs. There are many more complex variations that exist. Uh, one variation treats the sequence as a one-dimensional image and uses CNNs for fitting. For example, a sequence of words using an embedding representation can be viewed as an image. And the CNN convolves by sliding a con convolutional filter along the sequence. So it's like a one-dimensional convolutional filter. You can have additional hidden layers where each hidden layer is a sequence and feeds into the next hidden layer. And you can also have output be a sequence. And input and output share the hidden units. So this something called a seek-to-seek -seek learning, and, and they're used for language translation. So for example, the input data is a sequence of words in an English document, and the output sequence is this, the same words translated into German. You've got input is a sequence, the output is a sequence. And there's many more. So it's a, it's a rich area, and, and there's lots of recurrent neural networks out there. Again, one can have access to these. Okay, so we've talked of a number of neural networks, networks for images, networks for sequences, networks for just general data, and the question is when to use deep learning. So CNNs have had enormous success in, in image classification and modeling, and they're starting to be used in, in medical diagnosis. So examples include digital mammography, ophthalmology, MRI scans, and digital x-rays. And we talked briefly about using pre-trained images to be feature extractors for examples like this where you don't have that much training data. RNNs have had uh, big wins in speech modeling, language translation, and forecasting. So the question is, should we always use deep learning models? It seems they have the capability of taking over any kind of, of modeling. Often, the big successes occur when the signal-to-noise ratio is high. So what we mean by that is, for example, in image recognition and language translation, humans can, can classify images almost perfectly, right? especially natural images. That means that the information in the input image is enough to get the, the target exactly. So the signal is, the, there's a lot of signal, very little noise. The same is true for language translation. You've got large data sets and overfitting is not such a problem in cases like that. Because overfitting means fitting the noise, and so if there's not much noise, it's not going to be a problem. With human populations, 
trying to predict whether someone's going to respond to a drug based on, on, on their genetic profile, for example, this signal noise ratio is often very low. Yes. Because right? there's so much noise in right. human populations. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, you know, a lot of the data sets Rob and I see, in, in, for example, in the medical school, they're to do with human populations and can be very noisy. Right. So for noisier data, simpler models can, can often work better. So on the New York Stock Exchange data, that's somewhat noisy data. The AR5 model is, is much simpler than an RNN and performed as well. And on the IMDB review data, the linear model fit by Glimnet did as well as, as the neural network and, and better than the, the, the RNN. Granted, there's more sophisticated RNNs now that can do a bit better, but a lot of work to, for, for quite small gains in that case. So we endorse the Occam's razor principle. We prefer simpler models if they work as well, because they're more interpretable. Yeah. I think also remember, I think the, the successes we've seen with neural networks in this lecture, for example, that the, 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 um, the inputs have certain have come some kind of temporal or spatial structure, right? The, in the images, of course, there's there's uh, structure in the image. In the uh, time series examples or the, the speech example, the uh, in the, the movie review, there's there's structure in the inputs, right? There's yes. a time ordering, and neural networks have have the capability to, to model that kind right. of structure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And of course, the creators of neural networks and the people who work, work in it now are very creative in adapting yeah. to new kinds of data structures. Right. So the nice thing about a neural network is it's actually it's kind of a toolbox where you can you can tailor the uh, the, the network structure to the the things you know about the problem. Yeah. So it's a very uh, very rich way of, of modeling. 